So one of the things, the background stories to this was that um, while I was serving the first time, of course I was gay at the time, but I didn't ever try to talk about it or act on it. And I kind of wasn't to terms with myself yet. While I was actually in Desert Storm, there's an interesting story that um, I actually just published a book. It's coming out this month. Or I'm sorry, it's, we're finishing it this month, but it's going to be out of spring of next year. But it basically talks about some of these stories. So one of them was that I was in this track, and I was sitting there, and we had the artillery hit on the right side, and it looked like that it was really close. And then it hit on the left side, and I was like, from artillery perspective, I know somebody was homing in on it. So I was like, this might be it. You know, I mean, I was 18 years old or 19 at the time, and I thought, I'm going to die. This is it. This is my last moment, minute. And I looked at my track, and I had a picture of my brother and his girlfriend. And I remember thinking to myself that I'd never come to terms with my own sexuality, but I thought this is it. I've never, ever lived my life for myself, and I've never, ever come to terms with myself, and this might be the last second that I'm going to be on the earth. And it kind of stumped. I think that that was when I hit bottom to realize that, that I wasn't, I needed to come out, that I needed to explore this side of my life. And um, it happened right there in Desert Storm. So I got out and I went to college and that's when I, um, there were a lot of things that happened in college that coming out things, you know, just stories. I mean, one of the interesting things that I think is just to know our history. I think that that's so important. When I was in Germany, um, I went to Dachau to look at the, the prison camps there. And, you know, I mean, you get on the grounds there, and you're just like, it's just surreal. You know, so many people had died at the time, and it just feels so haunting. And, you know, I had, like, one of those little disc cameras because it was back in the 90s or whatever, and I only had, like, three or four pictures, so I wanted to make them good. So I basically um, saw this picture of a, or a uniform in this case, and this uniform had wooden shoes, and they had several uniforms. And I don't know what attracted me to this specific one, but I was like, I want a good picture of what these people had to wear. It was awful, you know, and so I took this picture and, you know, stuck it in my uh, shoe box and uh, forgot about it. This was before digital photography for anybody that's old enough to remember that. And so, so I went through college and I did everything that every other person that comes out does. You know, I had the homophobia as a social disease bumper sticker and I had the pink triangle stickers. And I, you know, I, you know, I empowered, I was empowered to, to advocate for, you know, just myself. And I had that pink triangle, and I never, ever understood the significance of that. Well, so I went back, and I looked in those shoebox later, and I was looking at those uniforms. And that uniform that I took a picture of was a uniform with a pink triangle on it. And that's when I realized that our history is so important to really understand and to know where we came from and to know how far we have to go. This was in the 90s, so this was when, uh, you know, I mean, it was still very much pre-Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Um, and it was just not... It was a totally different atmosphere then. So then I uh, decided after college and after coming out that I was going to re-enlist in the military. And I knew that this was going to be extremely hard because I'd already been out and I'd already come to terms with myself. And to be out of the closet and then ha to have to go back in was just substantial for me. I didn't know how I was going to do it. And I even talk about this in my book. Um, I had an HRC bumper sticker. And I tried to peel that sticker off before I first went to, my, to one of our drills. And that sticker would not come off that car. And it was almost like a metaphor that I was just sitting there trying to pick that off that car because I was so afraid that somebody couldn't see that. So I went back in in 2001. And um, it was very difficult because this was the years of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. We had homosexual briefings. I don't know if you've ever been to a homosexual briefing, but it's the worst thing in the world. It was basically the military telling us what gay people were allowed to do and what gay people were not allowed to do. At first, Don't Ask, Don't Tell was very, very exciting for us because we thought it's the first time we're going to be able to serve our country and then it turned into kind of a witch hunt because it was actually it gave the government or the military an actual law to be able to say you're not allowed to do these things or we can kick you out some of the things that they included were that you weren't allowed to marry somebody of the same sex or attempt to marry them because gay marriage was not legal then you couldn't go to um, you couldn't say that you were gay and you couldn't have sex with a member of the same gender so basically as long as you follow those rules, which I thought, you know, I can do that. That's, that's fine. But then what happened was people started seeing people's email. People started seeing a picture of you on vacation. And then they would ask, and they would basically pry in. And Don't Ask, Don't Tell was probably some of the roughest years that I've ever lived my life trying to, um, trying to keep that a secret. I talk about this quite a bit. You know, um, you just saw that clip, and obviously... I think that what that newscaster said in the show on HBO was probably what a lot of newscasters felt, 
but they didn't really say that kind of stuff. But one of the things that it didn't show was some of the answers to that. Now, I do want to preface that this isn't about politics, and I don't want it to be. I don't want you to think that just because they bash the people on the stage that, you know, I endorse that or anything. It's more the point that um, how people felt about a U.S. soldier not being stood up for, and I think that that's what veterans probably encounter every single day, is that unfortunately, while you're serving your country, you're the best, and then the minute you're, you're gone, people forget about you, and that's just so terrible. But, um, so the, uh, I went back in, went to college, um, Don't Ask, Don't Tell was really, really rough, it was very hard. There were times when people would come over to my house for my unit, they would call me and say, hey, we're coming over, we wanna play games or whatever, and I'd run through my house systematically, I had it down, that I would hide pictures, so I'd run through and grab all the pictures off the walls of vacations or anything, hide it. I had the routine that I would do, and then they would call and say, oh, we changed our mind. And then you just feel like an idiot. I, I would sit there and have all these pictures in my you know, hands and just think, this is just not right. And it really started to bubble this, this chip on my shoulder of, you know, this isn't right. I feel like that I'm fighting for everybody's rights except my own. And I have to hide and lie to be who I am to serve my country. And so um, then we went on to the fireworks. There, were, there was a year that I was watching the fireworks, and they were basically like, we want to take a minute to congratulate the men and women that serve our country. And I sat there, and I thought about it. Everybody was so patriotic, and it felt so good. And then I thought, I have to lie to do this. And it just felt so wrong, you know. So then um, Josh and I basically um, were in a relationship, and I got the call that I was going to be deployed again. And this was the first time I've been deployed twice, but it was the first time I was deployed being in a relationship with Josh. And so it was terrifying to me because um, it's hard to be in a relationship and it's very, very hard to have to leave. And military people every day will tell you when we get deployed, it is just treacherous on, on your family and your relationships. And um, I, words can't articulate how treacherous it is on an LGBT family because at the time we didn't have any kind of support. Josh and I hid underneath this escalator to be able to say goodbye to each other. And there were other families that were out there crying and their wives were, you know, like giving each other information so that way they could call each other. And they just felt that camaraderie of knowing that you've got other people that are here. And we hid under an escalator and cried. Um, there were so many stories of that. You know, I mean, there's so many things. And I talk about all this in my book because I... It's not ever about me. It's about LGBT veterans, and it's about understanding, you know, people patriotically say, you serve your country, we're so proud of you, and the things that you go through to serve your country. And I think to this day, people don't realize what LGBT citizens that are soldiers or, or airmen or service members have had to go through and the things that they, the lengths that they've had to go through to serve their country. It's not just being called away to war. It's lying and hiding and making up stories um, I would hear soldiers on the phone talking to their, their wives, and I would, I would think, oh my goodness, you can really hear their wife really loud on the other end. And it freaked me out, because I was like, how many times have I talked to Josh? And I'm like, okay, I love you, and on the other end, you're, thanks. You know, and I'm like, <laughs> somebody's going to be like, does your wife have a cold? So, so then I kind of freaked out. I'm like, this is not acceptable. We have to come up with a better way. So then I got a headphone, so I could basically keep it very, very low, and I would turn the volume so low that I could almost not even hear him, so that way I was sure nobody else could. We would text a lot. That was our solution, is that when I was in Primo, we would start texting each other, because it was easier to text, because I didn't have to worry. But then my friends would want to play on my iPhone, and they'd be like, well, let me see your iPhone, you know, do you have any good apps, and they'd be playing it. And I'd sit there thinking, oh my God, Josh, please don't text anything. You know, like even an I love you coming from Josh would be weird. So then, um, so then we came up with a code, and we were like, well, one time I wrote I love you on the iPhone, and it uh, auto-corrected to Oliver. <laughs> and so then, it's kind of funny, because that's what we started using as our code word. If, if I was on the phone, I would say Oliver, and that would mean I love you. And you know, I mean, it's, it's funny, but it's so sad to think that, that people that serve our country, that's what we had to resort to, you know? And that's, that's part of what um, Josh and I went through and just, just everything up to Don't Ask, Don't Tell. I mean, uh, through the pre mode was just really, really hard. Um, and getting deployed, you know, I mean, there were so many things. And again, I, I, I try to encapsulate all these because I don't, it's history. It's just like that pink triangle. That pink triangle has so much significance and meaning. 
And all this stuff is history, so that way people can never forget what people had to go through. And I think that that will cause us never to have to do it again. But when we were, when we were actually going over to war, I was on the plane, and you know, when, when it's a, full, a plane full of soldiers, they kind of let us have a little amenities. You know, they, people grab the mic and they kind of joke on the mic or whatever. And somebody grabbed the mic and they said, ladies and gentlemen, tonight's in-flight movie is going to be Brokeback Mountain. And everybody laughed on the plane. Everybody busted out in laughter because it was hilarious to them that they would never show a military plane full of military members Brokeback Mountain. And I'll never forget the cold, dark, lonely feeling that I felt sitting around looking at all my fellow soldiers thinking, you are my family. You're who I'm going to go to war with and you have to protect me. You're it. You're all I have going into this war zone and you're mocking me. You're making fun of me. And it felt so terrible. I mean, I landed in Germany. I called Josh and I was like, I don't know if I can do this. I mean, I could do it back in 1990 when I really wasn't coming to terms with myself. But being out, I don't think that I really can do this. It's going to be so hard, you know, with stuff like that. So we went through the deployment, and there were several things that had happened in the deployment. Um, you know, mortars, we, Skype, things. For anybody that's in here that's a veteran of the Vietnam era, you probably have no idea what a deployment is like now. Because I went in 1990, and I can tell you that even in 1990, we didn't have email. And I had to write physical letters that I would wait, you know, a month to get a response to. And now we have Skype, and we have, like, Internet. It's just amazing the difference, even in a war zone, that you can go to an MWR and be able to Skype. So that was a lifesaver for me. That really helped because Josh and I would Skype quite a bit. And there were many instances uh, when mortars would actually go off, and it was just customary. You'd hear a mortar hit, and you'd just you know, say, i got to go. And you'd take off, and you'd run to a bunker. And, you know, the funny thing about war is that for people that are back here, your family, they worry so much. We know what's going on. It's never scary to us because we know we're trained. That mortar hits, I grab my, it used to be called Kevlar, then it went to, it's like the military has a billion acronyms for stuff, so I don't want to cute, confuse anybody, so I grab my helmet, my uh, armor, <laughs> took off, I don't even remember the latest name for it anymore. But anyway, so I grab it, run out to the bunker, and then Josh is on the other end of Skype. And he's sitting there thinking, am I going to get a call? Like, what would happen if something happened to him? And I don't even know that I would get a call about it. And so those things had happened many times while I was in Iraq that caused us to really start thinking. So we had an R&R, &R, so I'd come home from R&R, &R, and that's now you get 15 days of leave. Actually, the military did away with that. Now you get nine-month deployments, and you don't get that anymore. But so we had 15 days of leave, and we came home. And, you know, Josh and I had talked a lot about marriage, and we talked about the strain on our relationship. And one of the things that I said was that if you wait for me, it's almost like a romantic movie. I said, if you wait for me for this deployment, I will marry you. You will be the one. This will be the test of time. This will be exactly what I needed to know that, that I want to be committed to you the rest of my life. And so halfway through the deployment with the Skype incidences where mortars went off, we had decided that we wanted to be married prior. We wanted to be married now, just in case something happened. Because I wanted something that an assurity that if I went back, I had this ring on my finger, that I knew that the love of my life that I would have committed to him forever. And so um, we called Washington, D.C., because that was the closest state that we thought could marry us. And they told us there was a wait time, and unfortunately it was after my leave would have been up, so we wouldn't have been able to do it. They said, but if you have a good excuse, we can give you a waiver. So we were like... What? Well, I'm deployed, and I actually have to go back to Iraq. Is that a good excuse? And, and, you know, Josh had said, you know, my spouse is deployed, and they're going back to Iraq. And you'd learn to talk in these pronouns that you never ever say he. You know, they have to go to Iraq. And they were like, oh, yeah, that should probably work. We can't guarantee, but if you come, we should probably be able to work with that. So then Josh hangs up, and I said, did you tell him we were gay? Like, does that matter? And so he calls him back, and he said, I just called you, and my spouse is going to Iraq. He, it's a he. And does that matter? And she's like laughs and she's real sweet. She's like, oh no, honey, come on. You know, so we, so we basically got into the car and drove to, to Washington, D.C. We were fortunate enough to get an efficient to marry us that was just awesome. This efficient was, uh, she researched really quickly because it was very significant for us. It was very private for Josh and I. Our families weren't there. 
But one of the things we wanted it to be was significant, because here I was in a time of war. We knew Don't Ask, Don't Tell was going to be repealed, but we didn't know any of the specifics of it. But we knew they weren't actively kicking people out. So that's why I decided to go ahead and get married on May the 3rd. So it was before the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. So Josh and I basically uh, worked with Tiffany Newman, and she found Leonard Matlevich's grave, who on his grave, he was one of the first people that ever fought the military for being kicked out for being gay. On his grave it said, when I was in the military, they gave me a medal for killing two men and a discharge for loving one. That was perfect. We were, I mean, it almost makes me kind of like, I get the little chills on my back talking about it because to us, this man had fought for, for us, for LGBT people, clear back, you know, in the 60s and 70s, well, 70s. And so basically he had fought for that. And, um, you know, when he died, you could not be married legally. It wasn't, it didn't exist. You could not be in the military and be gay. That did not exist. And here I was, a soldier, during my deployment from Iraq, getting married in his hometown in, uh, at his grave. People will say it's creepy that you guys got married at a graveyard, but it meant a lot to us. It was very, very important to us. We had no idea all this other stuff was going to happen. So I wore this ring so proudly, and I went back to Iraq. And, you know, I mean, I had to dodge a billion questions. Oh, you got married? You know, tell us about your wedding. And you know, it was just all the same stuff. And so I dodged them all. But one of the questions you cannot dodge is somebody said, you need to go to S1 because you get more benefits. And I was like, oh, yeah, I have to do that. And I was like, oh, God, how am I going to get out of that one? Because everybody wants more benefits and more money. So I, can't, I cannot make up an excuse to get out of that. But I kept dodging it and dodging it. So Don't Ask, Don't Tell came about. And um, the 20th came. And just like I've explained in many interviews, the day of the 20th, I went to work just like every single other day as a soldier. Nothing was different except that I couldn't lose my job for being who I was. That's it. That's the only difference. Um, but on TV, I started seeing that some of the Republican candidates were saying that they wanted to get into office and reinstate Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Ah, I just married somebody, and I cannot take that back. So, you know, I have 24 years of military service, and if that was reinstated at the time, it was such a threat to me because if that was reinstated, then I can't take that back. I would be discharged, and I would lose 24 years of my life. And so I submitted the question that you saw anonymously at first because I didn't want it to be about me. I wasn't out to anybody. And so Google writes me back an email. And who gets an email from Google? That is just kind of crazy. It's like, <laughs> email from Google. And I click it. And she said, we really like your question, but it's going to air two days after the repeal. So two things. We want you to re-ask the question, but say, make it past tense because we don't want it to be, we want it to seem like it's live or whatever. And she said, and we want you to show your face. I responded, no thank you, and deleted it, and went on. And I called my husband, who is definitely the fuel of my fire, always. And he said, that's fine, we don't have to ask it, but if somebody does reinstate, don't ask, don't tell, then we lose every bit of military service. And I think that it's important for somebody to ask what their response is to that, especially somebody serving in combat. So I did the question, and I clicked Submit, and my life flashed before me after I hit Submit. <laughs> the booing had happened, um, and then it was insane. It was like, from that point, Josh clicked on Google, and he said, oh, it's on four websites. And then he hit Refresh, and he said, oh, it's on like 50 websites. And then that was in the matter of like a minute, and then Refresh again. After about an hour, it was a thousand some hits and it was starting to play on all the news and it was like it was like right when he was getting ready to go to bed and I was just waking up for the day so I was terrified I was like maybe people didn't see it maybe I'm good <laughs> <laughs> and so I went to breakfast that morning and I, I you know I told my closest friend or like one of my closest friends there and she said I said I don't know what I'm gonna do and she said baby you're gonna do this you're gonna walk over there put your head up put your shoulders back and be proud of yourself so we went over to Chow. Chow is this great big auditorium like area with feeds thousands and thousands of people. There's probably 30 monitors on the screens everywhere. And so while I'm eating, I heard, and a gay soldier from Iraq asked this question in 2010 when I was deployed to Iraq. And I look and I'm on every monitor and I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I am in deep trouble. Like I don't know what I'm gonna do. So that continued to happen over the next two weeks. And so many things had happened. It was just amazing. Like, 
we were on the QRF and somebody was out there and had a weapon and he said, yeah, I heard Obama was talking about you today. And you're like, whoever thinks you're going to hear that in your life? That is just the weirdest <laughs> thing. But, but, you know, out of it, I can say that the military has been phenomenal. You know, one of my soldiers that came up to me afterwards, one of the first people that actually addressed me after it, because people were a little weird at first. They were running around with their laptops and, like, looking at YouTube and looking up at you. And he said, sir, you sign a lot of autographs. And I was like, eh, it's a little awkward. And he said, why is it awkward? And he grabbed my hand and he rubbed it. And he said, your gay isn't going to rub off on me. He said, my brother and his partner got married last year. And I would have never expected this out of this guy. And it, it was so many things had opened up then, um, so many doors had opened up. So we came back and used it as an opportunity to start advocating for equal rights. Josh and I have done so many things, um, so many initiatives. Josh was the creator of the uh, Marriage of All that we're both members of, and we decided to do the Sea Bus of Love. So we recognize that in Ohio, marriage equality does not exist, nor does it in Illinois, and that's just wrong. Um, we truly feel deep in our hearts that the Constitution of the United States should protect all citizens. You know, the Declaration of Independence says that we all have an unalienable rights, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it doesn't say anything about whether you love a man or a woman in that. And I think that Josh and I have been advocates for that uh, a lot. So we took these couples, we got 25 couples, and took them to the Supreme Court days before the DOMA hearing. So it was days before they actually released, five days, Five days before they released the, the thing, and so we went to this, you know, it was a lot of work. Josh did most of the work. But we uh, got, got there, took the couples to Washington, D.C., and we were getting them mass married by the person that did our wedding. And one of the guards comes up and says, because Josh had called to make sure it was appropriate or we were allowed to do it and not get kicked out or whatever, and they said, as long as you don't get on anywhere near the steps and stay off the property, because they put a lot of restrictions on because they were about to release the donor results. And so uh, we were sitting there, we did the wedding. It was very emotional for everybody because it was at the Supreme Court in a historic time. And one of the guards comes over and said, you know, guys, I cannot let you up there as a group. But by God, there's nothing that can stop me from, yeah, the, I think that, oops, yeah. There is a slide on that. I'm sorry, I'm not telling you to admit slides. So he said, by God, there's nothing that can stop me from letting those couples go up one by one. And he let every one of the couples go up through the Supreme Court and walk down the steps as we announced them husband and wife. So this was uh, our wedding at the, the site of Leonard Malovich, and that's his uh, grave site, or his uh, stone there. So the next slide, I think, might be the sea bus, yeah. So basically, um, I can't even tell you how, I mean, that's just like being here at the VA and seeing the color guard having the gay flag to watch these couples one by one walk down the Supreme Court steps announced uh, husband, husband, wife, and wife. It's amazing. We, um, so we, Josh and I joined a lawsuit from SLDN, and our lawsuit was pre-DOMA, so it was actually against DOMA. We were one of the major lawsuits, the only lawsuit in history beside Leonard Matlovich that actual gay service members had initiated <laughs> to fight DOMA. And our lawsuit has been going on, uh, and from the Windsor result, basically, the majority of our lawsuit was also deemed in our favor. Our stuff all had to do with the military side of it, how the military responds, how they call you husband and wife, because it always said a gender of the opposite sex, it always had that verbiage. And one of the things that's interesting is our lawsuit actually had veterans, uh, third ch ch chapter 38 or whatever, had the veterans part of it. And I don't know if you just read that uh, one of the veterans brought in the article that said that um, they, they were still kind of but not budging on the veterans piece of this with DOMA because nobody had challenged, Edie Windsor was not a veteran. And in our group, technically I was a veteran, so they're going from that angle. So they responded to say, no, we do have a veteran, not just retired people in our group. And so basically they were going back and forth with our lawsuit. And so we had just got the response that said that, at first they said, well, we're not gonna change the terminology, but we're not gonna defend it anymore. And our lawsuit said, no, that's unacceptable because the next administration might choose to you know, go by that terminology. So basically, we stuck our ground with the lawsuit, and um, you see that they're, they're now backing down, and they're going to change that, and that's awesome. That's the whole point of my message today, is that any one of you can be advocates of change. Soldiers, it's just ingrained in us to protect, defend, and that's what we do. But you need to do that for yourself as well, and that's what Josh and I continue to do. Um, 
September the 3rd, Josh actually went with me and got his military ID. Do you want to show him? This is very exciting. <laughs> so Josh got his military ID. I call this his gay card because it's pink. <laughs> Number one, it, it, is a, it is a pink card, and it actually literally says your spouse's name. So I don't know any other ID that has his spouse's name on it. So that is truly a gay card from the military. It's awesome. So anyway... We're very, very proud of that, that we, um, we were able to, you know, with all this avocation and all this fighting, he uh, just called himself out for wearing the same exact outfit that he did. When he, that is hilarious. I hope somebody got that on tape. <laughs> anyway, so the whole point is that any one of us can advocate for change. And if any one of us feels that there's an equity for a transgendered service member, for a woman who's never been president, then you need to stand up for yourself. And that's what our country is all about. Our country is for standing up for what you believe in, and one person can make a change, and any one of you can do that. So I think that that's all I really have to say. I, I want to be on time. Now, the one thing that I do want to ask real quick is that Lee Reinhardt actually came into the keynote last year, and he's a personal friend of mine. He is actually deployed right now in Afghanistan. So... Let me give you a little background with Lee, is that he got kicked out under Don't Ask, Don't Tell. He was one of the first people that actually fought to get back in. And you know, I always think of this, this is very chilling to me, because we just said, we want to congratulate everybody who's a, a, a veteran here. But just think about that. His country turned his back on him and kicked him out. And he was one of the first people in line coming back saying, I want to serve again. And right now, this very day, he's in Afghanistan serving his country. So I want to give them a round of applause first. And on the count of three, I'd like you to all say, thank you, Lee, come back safe. All right? Because I'm going to send this video to him. So one, two, three. Thank you, Lee, come back safe. That is awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, give yourselves a round of applause. You guys are awesome.